Did a good job. Yeah. And then, especially diving into rough yes, rocks. <laughs> <laughs> so, rough rocks. Um, short story to accompany this, if you'll indulge me. Um, we ran through a practice session of, of our summer presentations a few days ago. And I left with a sick feeling in my stomach for whatever reason. And I couldn't figure it out. Eventually I did. I had prepared to present you all of the information that you have seen before. Many of us interact a lot of times. Uh, and we will see some of that information. And I wasn't offering much more than that. So I, I made a last minute decision to make a few changes to the presentation. Specifically, I thought about some training that I've, I've had in recent years. And I've adopted that uh, to a pretty significant degree. So, so we'll, we'll see how this plays out. Uh, hopefully, in a, a positive way. <coughs> but as I mentioned, <coughs> I, I had originally planned to show you <coughs> a little bit of information that you're all fairly familiar with. I'm sure you've seen a number of times. <coughs> Our two primary population indices for rock grouse in the state of Ohio are drumming rate and our blood rate. A very similar program to what I described for the, the American Woodcock. Uh, voluntary hunters submitting their hunt information the, uh, to, to the Division of Wildlife with that we track blood rate in the state. That's what you see in the gray bars here. It's flush rate uh, with the number of flushes per 100 hours on the right side. The red line is our drumming rate with uh, the corresponding axis on the left side. And then through time, a big difference between our American Woodcock Diary and our, our Rough Grouse Diaries. Our Rough Grouse Diary has been in place since 1972. Very long data set. Similarly, we do black and brown information during that time. So, as I mentioned, I plan to throw all of this at you <laughs> and, and talk about this extremely uh, significant decline. Specifically, the most recent data uh, our drumming rate for this past spring is the lowest we've ever seen 0.5. Drummers per, per hundred stops. So that is a drummer for every 200 stops on our survey routes. That is alarming. A little bit of preliminary uh, diary data. Those diaries are just coming in to us. But I do have the online diaries that were submitted electronically at the end of the season. The rest of them, we have to wait for snail mail to bring them to us. And then I can enter that data and, and, and summarize it. Uh, but our flush rate is on track with that online information to drop by 25 to 35 percent. We'll say it's it's about 13 flushes per hundred hours of feeding. That's roughly, if my math is right, a flush every eight hours or so of feeding. That's on average. There are a lot, of, a lot of people that are spending a lot of time field not flushing any birds, and there are others that are, are having more and more success. Averaged out, uh, it comes to about a flush every eight hours. Preliminary information for the 2018 season. 2018 to 2019. So, as I mentioned, I have planned to throw all this at you, and then talk about why that occurred, or why that happened. This is our, our total work paper training in the state. Uh, from 1941 to 2017 is the, the most recent year that I had forced into this work and analysis data. Not included. What you see here from 41 to the present day is a gradual increase in the forest cover. Uh, not surprising when the eastern part of the state reforested through, through this, the 50, 40s, 50s, 60s, and mid 70s. Um, what I want you to key in on and what I really want to em emphasize with regard to our drumming rate, our, our flush rate, our general grouse population is this orange bar, which is the estimate of the total acreage of a 
wild forest that would fall in a young forest category, small diameter, <coughs> less than five inches to the age. 1968, the start of what could be considered the glory days uh, of rough grouse populations in Duncan in Ohio, we had 3.6 million acres of young forest within the state. That is better than half of the total forested acres that were in Ohio, period. So more than half of our forested acres were in that young forest, that prime grouse habitat uh, category. Since then, we're now at about 800,000 acres currently. And we, we've really leveled off there. We're actually slightly below the most recent estimates of 700,000 roughly. That is a 75% decline in young forest habitat in the state of Ohio during that time. <coughs> that is just an increase generally in total forest acres. Very important. And again, I have planned to harp on that for quite a long time. And that can be explained justifying the extreme declines that we see in, in drought populations. Perhaps. I then plan to or explain further. 6.8 million acres of our 8 million acres within of forest cover within the state is in private ownership. ODNR has no influence other than to make, to make general recommendations on how landowners can, uh, can manage their forest. Recently, there's, there's been an increasing number of, of, of in, or an increase in the number of landowners that own our forest today, specifically non-industrial landowners, people that are not in owning the, those forested acres for timber production, which is important when you think about the management of those forested acres. So the increasing number of landowners, smaller parcels, they're much less likely to harvest timber for a variety of reasons. We won't go into, into deep detail there. And as I mentioned, ODNR can only offer guidance to those people in, in terms of landowner or in terms of forest management, and that's if they come seek it from us. So we have 1.2 million, million forested acres in the state, that <clears throat> roughly 15 percent of our total forested acres in public ownership. 527,000 acres, roughly, is in state ownership. Parks, forestry, wildlife. I had plan to present all that to you, and it came across to me. What gave me that sick feeling in my stomach, I suppose, is it, it was excusing away some of the, the declines that we've seen in the drought population. Well, we can only impact this number of acres, so I won't do that. Why have you seen that trend? Um, that decrease in, in that extreme decrease, decrease in the Young forest? Well, in part, <coughs> because we had a huge surge of young forest acres as we reforested much of the state. And now that we have, we've leveled off in terms of the amount of forested acres we have in the state. We've got, we've got building negative societal attitudes toward forest management, toward active forest management, toward disturbance of forest acres. Timber and fire, generally considered bad. And often there's misconceptions about the wildlife value of those, those sorts of disturbances. As we mentioned with Woodcock, there are a variety of other wildlife species that benefit from, from that sort of disturbance. And in the interest of time, I won't go into detail there. There's also changing forest composition, specifically on our public areas. Uh, we, we're seeing loss of oak. Uh, more shade tolerant species are, are becoming more prevalent. We can exacerbate that problem with, with a poorly timed or ill advised timber harvest. We're trying to address those issues through a variety of scientifically based uh, decisions on, on timber management within, within our public land. There's also a ton of invasive threats. Uh, some of you with forestry backgrounds know very well what I'm talking about, know much better than I do. Uh, meaning, plant species in our forest that were not there before, and many of them thrive on disturbance. And if you disturb an area where this species is present, present without addressing that problem, then you've got an even bigger problem. Those invasive species tend to take over those areas and cause problems, problems much further down the line. I had also planned to include some regional flush rate information. So we submit, submit our regional flush rate information, or we submit our flush information to, to 
Appalachian region, it's all compiled. Uh, and you can get flush rates for individual states. They're actually more included than this. I've eliminated a few that don't cover the full span of time. And I've included just our neighbors, uh, Virginia, Kentucky, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, uh, Ohio is an orange bar. Um, and I had planned to use this to convey not only are we seeing declines in Ohio, but they are occurring to some degree across the Appalachian range. And I might have even said to you that Ohio dropped out of the pack for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is Ohio does not have a whole lot of forest compared to some of these other states that you've mentioned. And that I often hear from people, I go to Michigan all the time, I flush birds regularly, what's Ohio's problem? Why can't Ohio just call Michigan? and say, what are you guys doing, and we'll do that. Michigan's got nearly 20 million acres of forest cover within the state. That's what they are not in Georgia, but a large portion of that is public land, and public land, forest, public uh, ownership, and management as such. Uh, not to mention Wisconsin and Michigan, but it will be primarily aspen forests in a lot of that area hugely beneficial to grass for a variety of reasons. It's a much more beneficial species for grass, not only in food resources and also cover. To be managed on a 40-year rotation, our oak hickory forests are managed on, on a 100-year rotation, more likely. They're cutting twice for our 100-year rotation, generally. So, very small uh, amount of forest acres within the state of Ohio compared to some of our better grass in Indiana in there as well. I mean, you probably know what's going on in Indiana now. Close season, suspended season, I should say. There is a difference. And listed as a state endangered species. So I might have tried to use this as, as an excuse. Again, giving me that sick feeling in my stomach that I was going to excuse away some of our issues with grass and that no longer were before today. I was also going to throw this at you, Green Bird Atlas data from, from 1980s, uh, showing the distribution of detections of grouse in eastern Ohio. Green, representing our forest cover within the state, the National Land Cover Database. Pink blocks, hopefully those are visible to you in the back. Uh, pink blocks showing the grouse detections during that time. Again, this is the heyday of grouse uh, populations in the state. We had them throughout the eastern region, the heavily forested region. We did a second breeding in Atlas in the mid 2000s, 2006 to 2011. The black blocks represent the areas that we did not detect grouse. We detected grouse in the 80s. So, large areas of our forested eastern half of the state where we don't, we did not detect grouse within the survey. In the second we do have areas, pockets, uh, where we still detected grouse, <coughs> and a few of them. Are pretty substantial, and, and I had sort of a plan to highlight to you that they are in a lot of those areas by bringing our public land ownership, take away our grouse blocks. There, these highlight some of our biggest contiguous blocks of, of public land and land national forests and our largest state forests and, and combinations of, of wildlife areas, and, and, and as well as heavily forested, contiguously contiguous forest covered on private. So, I had planned to do all of that, and again, to me, it, it almost felt like I was making excuses and trying to justify. Well, we've still got grass on our public lands. Uh, we must be doing something right. right? I didn't sit well with it. And I thought about this training we went through. Some of the wildlife staff in the back will probably remember the training that we did. It's, in, in essence, a very simple process for addressing uh, issues and, and, and working with the public. On, on problems. Step one is very simple. There is a problem. And some of you are going to say, well, we had problems years ago when we went from collecting two birds an hour to one bird an hour. That's not what I'm talking about. This is a more substantial problem. When we reached a point where you've got to search intensively for eight hours to flush a bird, to find a bird in the state of Ohio. Now, that's on average. Remember that. But it's important that I tell you there is a problem. It's important that you hear me tell you there is a problem, in my opinion. 
With that, we are the agency to address the problem. It would be irresponsible if we did not. We are your state wildlife agency. This is a resident game bird. We are in charge uh, of managing for that bird. And, as Nathan pointed out with our mission, to conserve and improve fish and wildlife habitat, fish and wildlife resources in their habitat for sustainable use, and appreciation by all. I would argue that if it takes you eight hours of intention, intensive sort of searching to flush a bird, we no longer, <clears throat> or we no longer have that ability to, for all to appreciate that rough grouse species, whether they're hunting it or not. The approach, this is where we get into the meat of it. The approach we're taking is reasonable, sensible, and confident. I need to convey to you what we've been doing and what we hope to do. Population monitoring. I talked about some of the metrics we've used in the past. Our approach has been effective in monitoring the population and its trend through past years. But we're reaching a point where those surveys that we conduct are no longer as effective for such a low fragmented population as drumming routes. Uh, when we're detecting half of, half of drummer for 100 hours, or excuse me, 100 points in the field, I would argue that that survey method is becoming less and less effective. Similarly with our diary program. We're running out of grouse hunters that are willing to submit that information. Uh, and, and, and that causes a number of problems with that data. It, within the research station, uh, we've implemented new uh, quails monitoring routes with the assistance of Ohio State University and Dr. Gates in the back. Uh, we're rolling those out now for pheasants as well. I'd like to see that implemented for our drummers. Uh, an adjustment and improvement to our drumming route survey. That's what I'd like to see in the future. That's what I'd like to be able to offer you all. We have an improved monitoring method to track this, this population at its current state. I'd like to see that that monitoring target the areas that we have habitat improvement. That's a question that I get all, uh, quite often, is we've got these areas where we have cuts. What's the, what's the result in it? Quite often we can't tell you that because our monitoring efforts are not designed to focus on those areas where we've had intense habitat, man or habitat management. We've got several grouse management areas we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, we don't do intensive monitoring on those areas. I have attempted in the past few years to use some new equipment to do so, but it's been a challenge, and I'd like to see us uh, advance that a little further. We haven't included grouse monitoring within our bow hunter survey, which is primarily a fur bearer survey, for those of you unfamiliar. Uh, bow hunters in the field, there's a large number of them. They, they're sitting quietly for long periods of time, many days of the season. They submit observations of fur bearers to help us track those populations. We, we included grouse on that survey in 2015 to give us a better index of, of population numbers. <clears throat> I'd like to see us add, and I had the recommendation to add grouse observations to a turkey hunter survey. We've not typically surveyed uh, our spring turkey hunters annually. It's, it's been a more intermittent effort. Um, we're likely to, to implement an annual survey for our spring turkey hunters to get a sense of uh, effort in the field. They too, they're in the field, they're in large number during periods when rough grouse are growing. I'd like, I'd like to add a rough grouse observation uh, portion to, the, to that spring turkey hunter too. And then it's recently been brought up to me that OBNR you know, staff are spending a lot of time building a fairly structured manner where they have the boundary training. Boundaries that you see painted uh, around our various line up here. We've got to patrol those every, every so often. Uh, every year, uh, every other year, uh, we've got boots on the ground working with friends in those areas. We're regular animals. We know how much time they're out there. We know how what the distance they cover. We can start to ask them how many grouse are being encountered during that period. Developing the next to that time. Better monitor is what I'm hoping to offer to you in the future. Habitat management. ODNR divisions are making progress. Division forestry. We do have some, some areas that appear to have some, some very good grouse habitat. Melbourne State Forest, Carbide, Denton Furnace, Zaleski State Forest. I've already heard some stories today from 
from folks in Huntington's area to reflect the number of herbs. We have grouse management areas on two of those places with very intense cutting rotations. I've spoken to the Division of Forestry, some of their representatives prior to the summit and asked about young forest creation and what that trend has been like. Very oddly, the acreage has taken an impact in a year has not changed much over the last couple of decades. What has changed in the most recent decades is that much more of that action they take is harvest that they, they permit on their forest is creating young forest habitat. So a much higher proportion in the last 10 years is creating that ideal grouse habitat. We don't like to see. So in the division of wildlife, uh, there are a number of things that we can talk about. One of the most one of the key ones I'd like to mention is we had forest inventory completed in 2012 uh, with the National Wild Turkey Federation. We just have them involved with that. 25,000 acres inventory, 100,000 maps, uh, and we have more planned, as Lee mentioned, and we'd like to see that become comprehensive uh, inventory of all our, all our forest extents, which would be tremendously beneficial in uh, the monitoring and management of rough grouse. Oak regeneration, as I mentioned, is an issue and it's a, it's a concern of the division of wildlife. And we've already seen some harvests. And for those of you from southeast Ohio, you probably are aware that we've had a number of controlled burns on some of our wildlife areas. Uh, in promoting oak regeneration, that's a disturbance that, that should be very beneficial for rough grass in the future. And then we do our best, as I mentioned, to work on private land you know, and provide guidance in the way national forest when we when it's appropriate. But I'm not here to tell you that that has been enough. Clearly, it has not when you look at the population response. There are a number of factors impacting the, the grouse population, uh, but more is needed. There is no doubt about that. Proactive habitat management at regular intervals and proper size and placement within large contiguous forests. We're going to have to focus on these areas where we have grouse. Doesn't matter what resident game bird species you're talking about, if you're not putting the habitat where the birds are, it's not going to have an impact. So it's important that we understand this distribution. And this is this is seven, eight-year-old data at this point. Uh, so we need to put put the habitat where the birds are. We are fortunate that many of these areas are areas that are being marked and impacted. Quick example from Celeste State Forest. Uh, this is roughly two square miles. I didn't, I didn't measure it out, but you can identify at least a dozen cuts of various ages within this area. Uh, so, work is being done. There is grouse habitat out there. There might not be bird numbers that you would like. I know that there are birds in this photo because I've been there on drumming services. Don't pay any attention to those uh, coordinates at the bottom. <laughs> so, <laughs> so why why do we not have the bird numbers we'd like to see in an area like that? And that's possibly where, where research can play a role, our research biology. We have a tremendous resource at our fingertips in the, in the Appalachian Cooperative Grass Research Project that Ohio and many other Appalachian states <coughs> cooperated with during 1996, 2002, publication came out in 2004. <coughs> Thorough analysis with two study areas in, in Ohio, uh, marked uh, 700 birds um, to contribute to that study. Diet, survival, predation, home range, harvest, habitat use, all of that was compiled in the report of 2004. It's available to you. I have copies. Well, not printed copies with me, excuse me. Get, get my contact information if you have trouble finding it. I'll provide that whole report to you. We, go, we can talk in detail about what's included. What I want to point out to you is one of the summary points in, in, the, in the conclusion of that report. It's increases in population are most likely to come from habitat. Period. Habitat is, is the focus. Uh, I heard, I saw a number of comments on, on, the, on the survey prior to the summit. You've been beating the habitat drum for 40 years. It must be something else. And that is absolutely not the case. Habitat 
is key, regardless of the issue that we're talking about. We did have a Shawnee State Forest grouse trapping effort last year. Uh, it, it, was, it was done for a variety of reasons, but principally, we replicated the trapping effort we did through the Appalachian study and, and tried to use that as a population metric uh, with trapping rates, trap success rates. Uh, we did not catch any birds, 200 trap days. Uh, if we had, if we had uh, trap success similar to the Appalachian study in the late 90s and early 2000s, we could have expected to catch six to eight birds roughly. This was not an exhaustive effort, not a huge effort. It was telling, and I bring it up for one reason. I often get requests from folks, why don't we do another radio telemetry study to figure out what's going on with grouse. At this point, at the, at the population levels that we have, the density levels that we have, it's just not feasible. We couldn't catch enough birds for a meaningful sample size to do enough further research study. This is this is not in the realm of possibility at this point. Fortunately, we do have a wealth of information from very recently, and it's very detailed. Last thing I want to talk about with research is, is probably a topic that's on a lot of your mind because of information that's coming out of Pennsylvania and other places. Uh, there's less amount of virus infection. Uh, Ohio is currently cooperating with an Appalachian study. Uh, a number of Appalachian or states within the Appalachian range are contributing blood samples and other samples of rough grouse for disease analysis. Since they're collected during the, the hunting season, which would be after the, the prime infection period for West Nile virus, it's principally an antibody study. Has the bird that you shot and submitted a blood sample for been infected by West Nile virus and survived? That would be the only, only bit of information we could collect in this, in this study. Ohio offered no samples in 2018, 2019. I only had 17 participants, so I, I tried to reach out pretty broadly. To harvest survey respondents that said they hunted grouse, as well as our diary participants, and there just was not a lot of interest. Unfortunately, we'll submit uh, no samples from 2018 to 2019. I did have a hunter uh, that was able to submit a whole grouse from a previous season in a different freezer, and, and that's going to go uh, to, the, to the disease research facility uh, shortly. I do communicate with, with Lisa Williams and, and the Pennsylvania Game Commission quite frequently regarding their disease research. Um, it's, it's very likely that what they're finding in Pennsylvania, just across the border, is taking place in Ohio as well. Uh, there are going to be a lot of similar similarities there. Where we have the inability, unfortunately, to collect detailed data on our rough grouse population. <coughs> They have a much more substantial population and are, are, are able to get some of that good data. So that would be a valuable resource to us. A key that I want to point out, for those of you, I'm sure you've seen Lisa Williams' webinar on West Nile virus. If you have not, again, get a hold of me. I'll send you a link. Uh, it's, it's an excellent webinar explaining uh, sort of the, the process they are going through with West Nile virus uh, research, as well as the changes that they've made for their hunting season as a result. But I do want to point out uh, that at the end of all of their publications, at the end of that webinar, uh, Lisa is very careful to say, grouse do better in good habitat. So whether we're talking about disease or predation or whatever the case may be, grouse do better in better habitat. So the focus needs to be on that habitat. That is the mitigating action for all of our problems. There's nothing we can do about West Nile virus infection with regard to treatment, vaccination, and so forth. But by, by offering a, a, a more robust grouse population or resilient to that disease, that's got to happen in your habitat. Lastly, uh, West Nile virus infection likely exacerbates our habitat related declines a little more. We're learning more about that. We'll find out more about the prevalence of the disease, the infection rate, uh, number of disease. We, Pennsylvania does have a little bit on chick mortality in a laboratory setting, but again, we don't, we don't know a lot about uh, prevalence and, and infectiveness. And it may very well suppress growth in some of the areas where we've seen habitat improvement. I think that's a frustrating thing for a lot of Ohio hunters, uh, is we see areas where there should be grouse and there are not. 
And there can be a few factors that can ex explain that. Grouse have to be able to find that area. If it's an area that lost grouse previously, habitat is created, there's a limited distance that these birds are able to disperse and then find those new habitats. So you've got to have habitat adjacent to an existing population. But then also, with this new potential threat on the landscape, maybe it's suppressing bird numbers to a point where they're not occupying the habitat. Again, worth further research. <clears throat> and just to highlight here with, with last night of virus infection, you see this figure used in Lisa Williams' presentation if you watch it. Uh, this is the period in which West Nile virus uh, was detected in Ohio and other states. And, and we do see it pretty notable to find in all, across all of those states during that period. Uh, with some <coughs> able to rebound and others not so much. The last thing. Uh, within this, this segment of the presentation, I'd like to talk about hunting and harvest regulations. Uh, we again have a great resource in the Appalachian Cooperative Research Project. Uh, information on, on harvest. And of course, this is at a, time, a very different time in Ohio's grouse history, late 90s and early 2000s. I've already heard from members in the crowd. Boy, I wish we could go back to that time period. Some said we'd like to go back even further. I, I can understand that. Hopefully, it's through some of these findings, it's understood that we're not going back 30 years. We can't go back to that 3.6 uh, million acres of young forest uh, within a, a state that only has 8 million acres of forest total. But there is some good information on harvest, hunting, uh, hunting and harvest within, within the study, and largely they felt that at that point, the harvest that was occurring was roughly 12% of mortality in the state of, uh, excuse me, that's across the Appalachian Range. It was com compensatory on their study sites. Again, at the end of the spectrum, that is less impactful on the, on the overall population. But they did say it's uncertain at, uh, at higher rates. So at the rates that they observed, they felt like it was a, a slight impact on the population. They're uncertain what would happen at higher rates. We did have a February closure in 2009. Uh, you're probably all fairly <coughs> aware of that in, in response to population concerns, concerns over late season hunting, a period at which, for any of our neighboring species, the harvest becomes more additive. It ends up more on the side of the spectrum where it's, it's impacting the population. And there's reason for that. And, and Bob's going to cringe, I'm sure, as I try to explain it compensatory and atomist to this group, but in essence, the way I like to look at it is you're killing the chance that that bird will reproduce. That's, that's a way to look at that. The chance that that bird is going to contribute additional birds to the population. A bird in early fall has all of winter to survive and may, might not survive, uh, has fairly low chances of surviving through that period. So a bird killed in the fall had low chances of getting the spring and reproducing contributing more to that population. A bird in February has survived much of that season already and has much, much better chances of making it into the breeding season. So it's one of the reasons we had to focus on that, that late season uh, opportunity and shortening the season in 2009. And, uh, <clears throat> and then with that, I'll say, uh, beyond the Appalachian study, our current harvest rates are unknown. We don't know how much of the population we're taking. We, we can't say how big the, the grouse population is in terms of total numbers at this point. We have only an index to compare to previous years. What was our flush rate compared to, to prior years? What was our drumming rate compared to prior years? So this is an unknown, our, our current harvest rate. We do have uh, our, our hunter estimates, which I've talked about before. We estimate that there's 4,900, 5,200 uh, grouse hunters. They average about 4.7 days of field. This is for respondents to our survey. So again, there's, there's some bias within that, likely validity bias on more average numbers, more likely to respond to the survey. But uh, still, this is our estimate of grouse hunters within state based on that survey, with a total harvest of 3,500 grouse in the state. For our respondents, they average 0.7 grouse per hunter per season during 2017-2018. A 
I mentioned within the, the West Nile virus uh, section, Pennsylvania Game Commission made some late season changes recently. They've now got sort of their own framework for determining what happens during their, their late season uh, January, January in particular. That was based largely on, on information they collected with this disease study that their January harvest, the birds shot in January, a much higher proportion of those were adult birds. Those are our birds that are more likely to survive the breeding season and then successfully reproduce. They also found that there was a higher proportion of, of birds in January that had West Nile virus antibodies. And they were likely immune to the virus for the, for the remainder of their lives. Their concern uh, and the changes that they made was they were taking those birds out of the population and potentially having them. And they set a framework that you can, you can look at for yourself uh, for making decisions on how long the late season, the January season, uh, might be. We won't go into that. I will say, based on the surveys that we have, for the past three seasons on average, 45% of our grouse hunts in Ohio occur in the month of January. It's a very popular time of year to pursue grouse in Ohio. There are a variety of reasons for that. Uh, hunter preference, uh, other opportunities, other seasons around, around the state. A lot of our, of our grouse hunters are out-of-state hunters. There aren't a lot of January seasons available nearby, uh, at least with, with high levels of, of grouse opportunity. So 45% of our grouse hunts occurred in January the past three seasons. I need to be careful in how I say this, but I read a lot of reports from 2009 in the February season. I had Mike Reynolds, who was a biologist at the time. I had his reports. I had his correspondence. He very clearly was, was giving the essence that this is not a solution to our problems. Hunting restriction is not going to fix everything. And we're going to see populations, populations shoot up afterward. We've got other issues to address in habitat management. But we do have to ask ourselves whether at this point in our population, with our grass population, at the levels that, are, that, that currently uh, exist, in the season we have, is it, is it reasonable, sensible, and responsible, stealing a little bit of, of text from, from my training before. <clears throat> and, and are we potentially impacting that population in ways that we currently can't measure because we can't collect sufficient data uh, within the population? I will say, uh, and this is important for any regulation change, I suppose, but specifically for any sort of restriction, we need to provide you with a path forward. You know, if, if the season is being restricted in some way, how do we get that back? What's the population level we need to achieve to see that opportunity return? And that will that'll fall on us in, in the additional monitoring that I propose, potentially the research that, that may come down the pike through the Appalachian region. So, very last point from my, my training. And a good part of this, uh, I brought this out here sort of as a surprise even for some of the division staff. And if they didn't like what I did here, maybe they won't make me go to so many trains. <laughs> <laughs> and they say, no, Mark takes that stuff too seriously. <laughs> We're listening and we care. You're all here today. We're listening to your comments. We're trying to respond to your questions. I have personal interactions with a lot of our chapters and chapter, chapter leaders. Far too many of you have my personal cell phone. <laughs> but we're listening and we care. And with the survey that went out just recently, all right, grouse hunting is, is one of the most enjoyable things that we do. We recognize the majority of you feel that way. Uh, it's important to me that grouse persist in Ohio and even stronger positive response, no doubt. Uh, especially with the, those that strongly agree with that statement. There is one guy out there that really strongly disagrees with that. I don't know if I can't explain that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we got bad yeah. <laughs> Grouse hunting in Ohio should be closed as the population's improved. We were split down the middle. We had to ask, what, how do people feel about this? Uh, similar, similar questions like, 
slightly different is Ohio's current money treatment regulation should not change. We should not see any change at all from what we have got. I would say there was general disagreement with that uh, in the red bar show here. I think, I think most people recognize that there's probably some changes that are, are going to be appropriate in the coming years. OD and R should do everything possible. Uh, Stephen was correctly known on public lands. And they can talk a little about discrepancies on public and private lands. Uh, so we wanted to ask, you know, what about restriction on public lands? Uh, in general we're in agreement with that statement. Everything possible, ODNR should do everything possible, even restricting hunting on private lands. Slightly less agreement there, but still general. I would support grouse hunting restrictions uh, if I can continue to hunt grouse in Ohio at least some years. So if, I, I don't know that I have a, an idea of how this could play out, but if there was some sort of lottery opportunity and, and grouse hunting was only available to a hunter in, in a few years, how would you feel about that? I, there was pretty strong agreement with, with an opportunity set to I would support a shorter grouse season if it might benefit grouse populations in Ohio. I'm pretty strongly agree with that as well. That is all I have for you today on rough grouse. And, uh, I think we'll move into the comments for you. Simplistic. I understand the complication. One thing I'd like to point out, Wayne National Forest owns 250,000 acres, almost no harvested. That's in 12 counties, that whole southern part. Those that aren't aware of it, they're currently do redoing their forest plan. The problem is NEPA. That is a public involvement and analysis. Who's participating? For a lack of a better term, I'm going to say tree hunters. It's amazing. If you and they're presently involved in that, it's there's three kind of lies: lies, damn lies, and statistics. I think that's a favorite quote from somebody. And you know, it, my personal one, my favorite is uh, statistics lie and liars figure, you know. And this is not reflected on you, but this is my, because I understand, yeah. I understand the difficulties in this. One more time. Really, but, and I understand the quirks and all that, so don't misinterpret what I'm trying to say. Get involved in the Wayne National Forest. Think of this, 250,000 acres in 12 counties. That's the prime grouse habitat. Get involved because we're we're in, not getting involved. The environmental groups are. You addressed a lot of my concerns, but I'd like to make some suggestions. I don't believe for a second the increased harvest are basically based on your wildlife concerns. I think a coordination between wildlife and forestry, and how the how their uh, the cuts. Early secessional is not enough. It's how that's configured to reduce those home ranges. Grouse rely on renewal of successful nesting. If, if that brood can't get from here to there, the further they go, the less survival. Most of them die. 80% of them are dying in the first few weeks. That's that structure of how that habitat is connected. One of the problems is, and if you look at our dry sites, Oak Hickory in Southern Ohio, there's this taboo of doing more mesic sites and bottoms, which is a prime brood habitat. I know I'm preaching to the choir, but I'm trying to point out that's that coordination between forestry 
and the, and the ways to harvest in those bottoms and the riparian zones, which benefit woodcock, grouse. Grouse is an indicator species of all early sessional. And I'm talking everything from mammals, plants, the whole bit. The environmental groups have focused on interior birds. If you look at the bird list and the bird surveys, it's the early successional species that are doing the nose dive, but they're not connecting the dots. As a prior forest, uh, I, was, I was the FMO, the fire manager for years. Love prescribed burning, but it needs to be based towards wildlife and civiculture, not just fuel reduction. And that's all politics involved in where the money is. Spring burns, I can guarantee you, they're destroying woodcock and other nests. Amen. They are, right? I, mm -hmm. They are. I support prescribed burning, but I think there needs to be more connection between the impacts of wildlife and the benefits to the forest. I'm sorry, but uh, thank you. One more comment. Yeah, I, I just want to say again, and I'll just go back to this. As much as the people in this room are concerned about grouse, because we're grouse hunters and we have a, a, an additional connection, uh, I remember when I was 12 years old in the state of Ohio, I was, I was at, at, at one of my friend's houses. I'd never seen a grouse before in my life, and I had the bejesus scared out, out of me. We were out playing in the woods, you know, or at the edge of the woods, and a grouse flushed. First time I've ever seen a grouse in my life. One of the most amazing things I've ever seen in my life. I remember that vividly. Unless we make more people outside this room and outside this group of people uh, care about these birds the way we care about them and understand these birds about uh, the way we understand them, uh, the impact's going to be very small. Uh, so I'm just going to go back to the education piece. I think that not very many people, especially uh, school kids, because of that big red line going down hard, uh, know what a rough grouse is or have any idea uh, why they're important or why they're super cool. And I could talk about it for an hour, but until we start impacting people beyond uh, just hunting, uh, it's not going to have a broad impact in the state of Ohio. The state has got to do something to educate our state population around our universities, our schools, about the importance of habitat management, forest management, especially for the rough grouse population, but also for fire control. Or we're going to end up like one of these western states one of these days, and we're going to go like a matchbook. Um, the liberal population around Athens, Columbus, Cincinnati, everywhere there's a big university. All those liberal-minded people are against cutting, period. Period. They want to see 100, 200-year-old oak forests, and they don't care if it's going to go up like a matchbook, or they don't know that it's going to go up like a matchbook. You know, those forests are going to die, and we're going to end up on the same mess as the West of the So if that's something the state, you guys have got to do something. You have got to get involved with these universities and, and get a presence on campus and educate people. Because they are to take it one step further, educating the general public. This data is very compelling, very educational, and the only way for us to get that data is to come here today. How do we get that data outside of coming to these meetings? How, how can I forward this data, help socialize this data, help institutionalize this data to be a compelling resource for the general public, not just focusing? Uh, diary info. Where can I sign up? Get a hold of me. Uh, I've got cards with me. I take volunteers. I can mail them to you, email them to you. That was an easy one. Uh, are we all only tra tracking population trends or can population numbers be determined? We touched on that a little bit. At this point, we only have an index. We can't say how many grouse there may you can't give a, a total population estimate. Um, and then what does it take to get to that? Uh, so there are some survey methods. You'll see some of those with, with quail and pheasant today uh, that can get us a better estimate of how many birds might be in the state, give you a better estimate of the density of birds for a, a, a certain area, and we can apply that to the occupied range and get a total population estimate. 
maybe some of the, the changes that I discussed in the population model and how we need to improve those given our current status, uh, population status. Is it time to close the January season uh, based on Pennsylvania data, <coughs> data showing resistance to West Nile virus? Um, good question. I mean, there are a lot of unknowns. I touched on some of those in the presentation, but it's something we're looking at very closely. As I mentioned, Pennsylvania has a wealth of data in, in the grouse population that they have uh, and some of, the, some of the survey methodologies that they use that we can potentially apply to Ohio grouse populations. Not a whole lot of difference there in, in a lot of regards. So when they're looking at total of number of adults in their January harvest and the West Nile virus <coughs> antibodies prevalent within their, their January harvest, that's something that we have to consider pretty strongly. It's unlikely that we're going to be able to collect that level of data in Ohio for all the reasons I described. So, yeah, we may we may very well be. We're watching very closely what Pennsylvania is doing with that. <clears throat> Something has to be done to change the attitude toward forest management in Ohio. What is everything are doing to alter the perception of forest management? Um, so. <clears throat> We touched on this a little bit with, with American Woodcock. You know, we, we can put out uh, all the habitat information people can consume, but we can't make them consume it. Uh, we have private lands biologists that will work with landowners. There are uh, an even larger number of service foresters within the Division of Forestry that will help you meet your land management goals. Uh, I mentioned we're working with the Division of Forestry on that video series. I'm, hope, I'm hopeful that that will be an encouraging thing touches on non-game uh, benefits to young forest management, game birds specifically with my role in that, and then white-tailed deer. We tried to touch on all the bases that people might be interested in, in, in managing the land for wildlife. Uh, so it's, it would be my hope that watching a three-minute video is a little more appealing to people than calling a, a, a private land biologist or service forest, forest or to their property and, and having them try and work with them to manage, uh, manage that property. So, so yes, I guess was, would be the short answer. Uh, is there any opportunity for the Division of Wildlife to do more timber sales? The Division of Wildlife on land to increase our uh, successional habitat and revenue for future habitat projects. Is there any opportunity? I would say yes. I don't know if any of our other Division of Wildlife staff who are involved with public lands would like to talk about the trends there. Uh, but again, drink more bourbon. Why don't we? Prices are good. So again, I mean, the short answer is yes, there, there is opportunity. Uh, but we're going to have to take all of those factors that I mentioned earlier into account. You know, is, that, is that action going to promote healthy forest in the long term, when, when that becomes when that stand becomes a mature stand, is it going to have the species composition primarily the oaks that we'd like to see to be beneficial to wildlife in the future? Are we going to create an invasive problem? I'm not saying that these are things that are going to prevent us from, from doing forest management, specifically using those cuts, clear cuts and so forth. But there are hurdles we've got to get over in order to make those actions happen. Mark, if I can jump in on that question as well. You know, we are laying the groundwork for a better approach to timber sales. Um, you know, Med Mark mentioned earlier in his presentation about losses of dealing with invasives. You know, some of the other issues associated with forest management. So in the last you know, four or five years, some of the steps we've taken is we've gone through and uh, for some of our public land, some of our wildlife areas, we've done a forest inventory. We've had contractors come in that specialize in forest management, do a forest inventory, give us detailed information about what types of forest, what the age of the forest, and, and what the species composition is in, on some of our public lands. Along with that, we've trained some of our field staff that manage these lands in software called OakSilva. It's a scientifically based software program that uses that forest inventory data and has embedded in it through decades of research 
you know, what are the best management practices that could be applied to an area based on the species composition, based on whether you have a north-facing or south-facing slope, and what your objectives are for that area. And so we're starting to use that software, we're starting to use that forest inventory to start planning out where do we cut, what types of cuts do we need, do we need clear cuts, do we need shelter cuts, and you know, hopefully through a scientific process, better you know, direct our management efforts to benefit grouse, woodcock, you know, and a wide variety of the forest species. I point out too that you know, Mark hasn't mentioned it, that he and another person on our staff that, that specializes in, in forest non-game species have partnered that they've been invited down to um, some private land events down in southern Ohio in Benton County, uh, putting on workshops for landowners that have privately owned forest habitats, communicating with them what are some best management practices for the forest that they own. Many of those landowners are interested in wildlife, some are merely interested in what type of revenue can they get from the forest uh, resources they have on their property. So, you know, we are taking steps to look at how can we better manage the forest on our lands and how can we communicate those messages to private landowners as well. Next question. If the state believes a shortened season will help, why not suspend the season altogether? Um, two, I guess, similar but slightly different actions in the a season suspension, there is no longer opportunity for, for you to go afield uh, in pursuit of rough grass. And if we can offer even, even a, a slightly restricted opportunity in future years, uh, addressing other issues, specifically habitat with our, with our rough grass population, we want to be able to offer, offer that opportunity rather than make a leap ahead and say the season should be suspended and we should we should no longer <clears throat> have have rough grass hunting in the state. So, uh, so I, I would I would say that we're looking at a step down approach, address some of the more concerning issues with with rough grass hunting and harvest in the state. Uh, specifically, much like the change in 2009, we look at that late season harvest and, and the potential impact that that could have. As I mentioned, there are a lot of unknowns, a lot of uncertainties that, that come along with uh, with those sorts of changes and what impact they might have. But uh, with the information we have, those, those seem like the, the appropriate actions. So I don't know if anybody else would like to. I will say that the biggest advocates for grouse populations are in this room, and you guys are not looking at the here look left and right. You guys are down there, sitting there. And so you know, one of our concerns is that we remove you know, the tradition of grouse hunting altogether, knowing that there's some <coughs> new hunters in this room. We might lose some of that advocacy. I know I'm out of line. That was my question. And that's that's who I am. I'm not, I'm a conservative before <coughs> I'm a hunter. I just assume you know you can still hunt without a gun, okay? You can still go in the woods with your bird belt and hunt and get a bird appointed and flush a bird. You don't have to kill the bird to enjoy the bird. So I'm willing to give up my hunting with a gun if it'll help the state get caught up with you know, where we're at with this whole thing. You know, I think it's just going to take a cooperative effort from us all to get there. Mark, if I can make a policy comment, it's related to a couple different things here. Um, I want you all, I'm not going to scold you, but I want you to be careful when we divide talk about tree huggers and hunters because in this country we're seeing a huge increase in bird watchers and a pretty steady decrease in hunters but you know what bird bird watchers or birders in this state want to see what they want to put on their life list a rough grouse so where you can we need to find common ground birders National Audubon Society group and a lot of we made a ton of progress with the birding community with young forest habitat You've got Fish and Wildlife Service groups. You've got what we call the Joint Venture System. They're all promoting woodcock, young forest habitat. So look where we have common ground and be careful about dividing. Because they're advocates too. I could tell, I could probably make an income in the spring taking birders to see a drumming rough grouse. I could have a cottage industry because I know where there are a few at and they all want to see them. So just 
to think from a policy standpoint, we are at it, we love this bird, but there are other people out there who we can recruit. Yes, it takes education, but a lot of these birding groups are on board. If you're interested, if you look at that breeding bird atlas that Marky showed pictures of, when we published that book a couple of years ago, we had individuals actually sponsor individual species pages to help the printing costs. It was a birder who actually paid for the rough grouse page in that book. It's important to him, he lives in East Central Ohio, and he still sees them around some of those Muskegon Watershed Conservancy District lakes. So from a policy standpoint, remember we can use those people in step with us to continue to promote young forest habitat and get that message out. And one other quick policy thing, um, a question I got was how, do, uh, how does the state determine things like species of special interest, species of concern, threatened or endangered status? Well, our biologists make recommendations. And a species of interest or a species of concern is a thing that if we get a good biological argument, we can make that recommendation uh, administratively, and that species then gets that designation until we choose to change it. Um, and so, actually, you may not know this. I can't remember the year, it was two or three years ago, both northern bobwhite and rough grouse were elevated to species of concern in this state. And that's helpful um, from a number of reasons, funding-wise, leveraging attention to those species, habitat management. Now, in terms of listing something as threatened or endangered, there is a similar process, but that would actually go to our Ohio Wildlife Council. If we actually were to petition to have a species in the state of Ohio which is a threat or a danger, we would pro provide a biological case for that, and then the Wildlife Council would vote on those designations. And I can tell you at the present moment, we have no plans to do that. Um, and I think I've got more policy questions. Well, looking at the clock, I'll jump into this one and let you go ahead and look at that, Mike. And then this actually, this last policy question, I think I can do at the end of the day. It has to do with the upland habitat standard. Okay. So I'll save this for later in the morning or afternoon. Problem is greater than habitat. What does the state believe are the other major problems? Uh, so we, we kind of blew through some of these. Uh, the problem is not habitat alone, but that is by far 